why do you believe it's important for businesses to be actively involved in their communities and how can doing so really impact both the company and the community? Well, I think community is what we have, right? I think everybody talks about, I think there's a lot centered around mental health, around or the need to be happy and what makes people happy and engaged. And I think one of the pillars of that is community. I have little kids, so to sure. be able to take my kids to a park I designed and for them to see something I did is, is a big deal. What you give back, you get back, you know, more than double, I think. And are you an engineer who wants to grow your own organization or even grow your own department within a larger engineering organization? Well, then you're going to have to focus on the culture. Culture meaning how people feel when they show up to work. In this episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I have with me Dana Clark. Dana is the president of Clark, Azar and Associates. And she's going to talk about her journey from being an engineer working for a larger organization to taking that risk going out on her own in building something special as she builds a consulting firm. Let's jump right in. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest onto the show for today. Dana Clark is a licensed professional engineer and president of Clark Azar and Associates. Dana, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you, Anthony. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. So just to kind of get us started off, tell us a little bit about your career journey to date and, you know, kind of up to today and what you're doing on a daily basis now. All right. Well, my career really took an interesting turn around 2017. You know, I was a project manager working for an engineering firm in Germantown, Maryland, where the team and I had worked together for a multitude of years pretty much right after I graduated from college. I moved to Florida, and then I wound up moving back to Maryland um, several years after that and went to work for this firm. And we got bought by um, a larger firm, and we worked for them for several years. And then my partner and I, my now business partner, approached me about starting up our own firm in 2017. So that was what we did. We became a woman-owned business and and collaborated collaborated on a lot of our projects, but I was 33 years old and a mother of two. I had a 4-year-old and a 2-year-old and that was really not what I was thinking I was going to be doing was was running my own business, but it was an exciting opportunity and I was kind of feeling the need for a change. So we we jumped in with both feet. So that was 7 years ago and here we are. You're still going strong. Yeah, good for you. We are. I mean, we've doubled um, in every metric in the last, really, the six-year mark. We opened a second office. We added huh? landscape architecture in addition to our site civil practice. So, yeah, we're going strong. I really enjoy it on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm kind of all over the place, honestly. I do all of our, like I said, our business stuff, our HR, our invoicing, our accounting, our business development is really something I've taken on and really taken interest in building relationships because I think this industry is all about relationships and furthering the company in that way while also building our culture that we are proud of in our, in our own firm. That's great. That's great. So, well, first of all, you know, I commend you on taking that risk, which is always a risk in your career when you kind of go out and do something like this for sure, especially as an engineer, because we're kind of trained as technical professionals, not so much business minded yeah. professionals, but, but tell us a little bit about the company. Tell us about the size, your locations, the services you offer. Sure. So we have 12 now. And we have two offices. We operate our primary location is in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is you had a suburb of D.C. So we do a lot of work for the school system and the park system down there, as well as several municipalities. We've kind of historically been a Montgomery County slash D.C. firm, which in the Baltimore, D.C. market, if you want to get involved in Baltimore, you really need a Baltimore location because they they like to keep things close to the vest in Baltimore. And having grown up here, I was well aware of that. My business partner is out of Massachusetts, and he really likes dealing with the, the technical issues of each project. And whereas I'm kind of more the, the big 
picture business person. So that that really that synergy really works well for us. So that's when I we had been doing more work in in counties surrounding Baltimore, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Carroll County. I know a lot of people probably don't know where these are, but we were expanding our markets in, into Baltimore. So I decided we really needed a Baltimore focused location about a year ago, which is when we added the second office, which has really been exciting and has really been well received. We've been doing a lot of work in Baltimore City, which is new been very interesting because there's a lot of revitalization happening in the city right now. A lot of developers going in and really doing community focused work to try to revitalize the city. And, you know, there's a lot of areas needing assistance and trying to help with the, the housing issues uh, in and around the city. So we've been able to really expand our our reach and do a lot of the projects that we enjoy through that that addition of the second office. That's great. Again, congrats. I think it's for a small business to open up a, another location is certainly a big lift and there's a lot of logistics and a lot of things that go into it. So that that's great that you're growing and expanding. And, you know, obviously you're passionate about, you know, engaging with the communities. And I guess one question I have around that is, why do you believe it's important for businesses to be actively involved in their communities and how can doing so really impact both the company and the community? Well, I think community is what we have, right? I think everybody talks about, I think there's a lot centered around mental health, around or the need to be happy and what makes people happy and engaged. And I think one of the pillars of that is community and feeling involved and feeling like you're making a difference. And I think especially touching on the younger generation and dealing with some of the labor issues and, and connecting with the, the younger generation of engineers that's coming out, they want to do well in their community. They want to contribute. They need to feel like they are doing meaningful work. And I think that that's something they've been able to teach some of us older folks. And, you know, when Jason and I started the business seven years ago, we had done a lot of commercial developments. I personally did a lot of McDonald's, 7-Elevens, a lot of your big corporate designs, which didn't feel particularly gratifying to me. But when, you know, you're designing a new park or new schools, I have little kids. So to sure. be able to take my kids to a park I designed and for them to see something I did is is a big deal. And to know that you're committing your time and effort and really doing better for the communities. You know, every time we open a new school or build a new athletic facility where kids can play where they couldn't play before. And, you know, the community gets a lot of engagement and benefit out of that. I think that that's extremely gratifying. And I think that businesses, what you give back, you get back, you know, more than double, I think. And to engage in the community and to have that outreach. And I'm also big on, on mentorship and, and feel the same way about giving into younger individuals. You, you get that back. So I think that it's just a good business practice from a business model, but it also makes everybody a little happier to come to work every day. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think people do want to be kind of socially engaged today and, you know, do something, use their profession and their skills to better better the world in a sense. And obviously civil engineering is a perfect profession for that, for sure. And, you know, before we dive into leadership a little bit, I want to ask you kind of one more question around community design. I know that you have experience with sustainable design methods can you talk a little bit about the role of kind of low impact sustainable design as it evolves in civil engineering, you know, particularly maybe in some of the projects that might serve a community or that you've seen in your work? Sure. I think Maryland is absolutely on the forefront of sustainable design and stormwater management and all of those factors in environmental considerations, forest conservation, wetland management in ways that other states really aren't. So I think that we are leading the charge in that way. And in doing a lot of community projects, a lot of the there are a lot of state regulations that are coming into effect where these community projects need to meet energy goals and they need to 
commit to, they won't get their permits if they're not following environmentally sound designs. And they need to get, in some cases, LEED certifications or some other green certifications. So we implement a lot of different strategies, especially through site design. There are some things in site you can't control, but we do a lot of infiltration practices and recharging groundwater in small stormwater management practices to limit runoff and treat at the source and just fundamentally limiting impervious in general because impervious is really not environmentally sound anyway regardless of how you handle it but then you know for what we do have to use we do a lot of pervious pavements i personally designed latonia recreational park which is a big park in gaithersburg in montgomery county and we did the biggest pervious pavement parking lot that the parks department had ever done before And we also did synthetic turf fields. So we do a lot of the of synthetic turf fields, which, you know, you can build an infiltration system underneath the turf so that the turf is providing its own stormwater management re- and recharging groundwater. So there are all these little practices, I think, underneath the surface that people don't necessarily realize. People see solar panels and, yeah, we do some solar panels and we do some green roofs and stuff. But there's a lot you can do under the ground that people don't necessarily know that you're doing. And the more you can treat at the source in terms of stormwater, you know, the less pollutants are getting into the bay and all those things that people really notice and really care about. So I think there's a lot of, you know, we're doing a lot of electric vehicle charging stations and trying to implement that into a lot of our designs. So I think each site is really different in what it can and cannot accomplish from an environmentally sound design, but just trying to limit the footprint of the development, right? To try to go up if you can on a building instead of out so that you're not taking down as many trees or doing things like that. I think in there are a lot of little things that can add up in every project to make it more environmentally sound and sustainable. Yeah, that's great. And I think really like that kind of captures what I think is really one of the exciting things about civil engineering is that your community, your geographic location has such an impact on your company in terms of your mission, your vision, the services you provide, the people you interact with. You know, like you gave some great examples of Maryland and some of the things they're doing, which allows you to get involved with projects like that. I had another gentleman on the show who his company specifically works with uh, Native American like reservations and nations just doing civil engineering for their properties, right? So it's like, it's like wherever you're located, like civil engineering is such a community based service, which is awesome because it does give you the ability to engage with your community. And a lot of times you of course also live in that community or that surrounding area. So it's like, you really, like you said, your kid, you're designing a park that your kids are going to go to. Right. So I think that's what can make the civil engineering industry very rewarding because of that. You're kind of baked into your own community in a sense. Absolutely. And there are so many things. I was actually just interviewing a high school student who wants to be a part-time intern. And we were talking about all of the facets of civil engineering and everything that goes into it and everything you have to think about, the utilities, the the environmental impacts, the, the logistics of a site. The infrastructure in this country is not in good shape. It's old. And, you know, to keep things running at the way that everyone expects them to be running is going to take a lot of work over decades. You know, things are failing. We saw that with the key bridge, right? You know, things aren't designed for the modern world to the same extent that maybe people would like to think that they are. So there's no shortage of, of facets that civil engineering touches. Yeah, for sure. No, no doubt about that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about leadership. You've led a team of professionals who have worked together now for a long time. If I asked your team members what your management style was, how do you think that they would respond to me? Oh, that's funny that you asked what they would say. I think they would say I'm a little nuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that I... You know, I kind of came into this, like we said, at a very young age, and I think there was there were people that I, were now working for me that were older than me, and then I was in charge now. So it was an interesting juxtaposition, and I think it's taken some time for everyone to be like, all right, you know, she's got this. 
but I think that I can only lead in the way that I feel, right? So I lead from a place of compassion for my my people and from a place of really, you know, caring about who they are and caring about what matters to them in terms of what they're working on or in terms of their life, you know? I really strive to provide an atmosphere where everyone feels very comfortable and everyone is, you know, we have flexibility in terms of, you know, like I said, I am a mom and I will chaperone field trips and I will, if it means I'm working later, then that'll happen. But I, I make time for that. And it's important to me that all my employees know that I want them to make that time for their families. And I don't want to run anybody into the ground or, or feel like, you know, they can't or they can't come to me. Sometimes I feel like I'm everybody's therapist more than I am uh, their boss because I don't, I think that I have at least accomplished that and that they feel like they can tell me just about anything. That's great. So I, that's I'm awesome. proud of that. And I think that that's one of the most fun things for me is being able to control that environment because I've certainly worked in some environments that weren't that pleasant. And I want everybody to want to come to work every day. So I think that that is really an environment that I strive for. And I try to lead through that example. Yeah, that's great. And I really love how you said it there. You know, you want people to want to come to work. I think like for some reason, I think in the past, the idea was like, hey, a job is something you have to go to, you have to do, you have to show up, but like it's not, it can't really be fun type of thing. And I think that, you know, I know me as an entrepreneur and a business owner, I have the same view as you. It's like, well, I don't want to go to a job that I don't want to enjoy every day. And I don't want yeah. people certainly to do it. Like, what's the point of that? You spend more time at work a lot of times than you do at home. So, so I love that. And I really liked what you also said earlier. You said, you know, you're really focused on being able to build the culture there the way you want to build it. And to me, a really good definition I heard of culture is like how people feel like when they come to work. And so I think if, you know, I think as leaders, you know, all of us that are leading organizations, we have the ability to build that culture and and really drive how people feel when they show up every day. Yep. And I think kind of what you said was really great in that you're not trying to burn anybody out. You want them to enjoy their work, come to work every day excited. And I think leading by example, which you, you said as well, like if you take off for your own kids, you're showing them that, you know, there's things that are important that everyone should kind of hold important. And I want you to hold that important too. And so I think that's a great way, approach. Yeah, I really don't. And I try to stress and I have employees that are, are worried about my time or worried about bothering me or worried about asking a question. And that's like the worst thing I can hear because I don't consider my time to be any more valuable than anybody else's. I mean, yeah, sometimes I look like I'm running around like a crazy person to get to soccer practice uh, on time. But, you know, I think that I try to always be accessible. Yeah, no, that's great. I love that approach. And that, I think that that goes a real long way. Now, I know you're also passionate about furthering women in engineering, which we are, are also at EMI. We have a podcast, in fact, Women in Engineering. What, what are some of the strategies that you've implemented to support and empower women within your team and just in the industry at large? That is something I'm really passionate about. I, you know, this has historically been a male dominated field and I did not have the best experiences coming up in that male dominated field. And that is something I refuse to let happen to the women that work for me. So I make sure for one that they all feel very supported and, you know, comfortable on job sites because the reality is construction sites are not always the most comfortable places for women. And, you know, just letting them know that I've got their back in any situation that they that they end up in or that, you know, we're putting them in. I do feel a responsibility there. Um, as far as furthering women in general, I'm um, on the board of directors at or the board uh, for Crew Baltimore, which is a woman's uh, organization revolved around commercial real estate, which I think is a little misleading because it's really all facets of property development. You know, it's a group of female engineers, architects, contractors, developers, property managers, you know, you name it, we've got it in Crew. And I think it's just really done a lot for me personally to connect with 
all these women that are on the same page, right? We're, we're in really important positions. We're doing meaningful work, running companies, but also, you know, trying to figure out middle school, which my daughter starts next week and get to soccer practice on time. So I think there's a lot to be said for having that community of women who get it and can lift each other up in that way. And at the same time, you know, isn't competitive. We are on top of it. We're trying to support each other. We're always giving leads to each other. And I'm also really passionate about mentorship. I've given some talks at, at uh, Morgan State, and I'm willing to talk to anybody really about how they can get their feet in the door or, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? And I think that just getting young people started at an early age and showing women that they can do anything and they can have, I mean, you can't necessarily have it all at the same time, I think, in trying to say that you're the best mom and the best business owner, you know, in the same moment can be challenging for women. But even through my own kids, for them to see that, you know, mom can show up at, at PTA events and also run her own company, and that's become their norm. And I think that's important for both my son and my daughter to see women running companies and and knowing that that is not an unusual thing. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I think that, I think what you've done in your career by leaving a larger company, taking a risk, it's absolutely a risk going out on your own and starting a company. I mean, I know that firsthand and succeeding, but then being able to talk to people about it, right? Spread the word, go speak at schools, I think is the next step in the process because I think what you did is awesome. And it's even better if people can kind of learn from that, learn from your experience and like, you know, wow, you know, if Dana did it, maybe I can do it too type of thing. That's that's exactly what I feel like, because there's nothing special about me or what I did. Like, and I tell this to my employees, I'm like, anything I do, I feel like, you know, you can do. I'm not smarter than anybody. I don't feel like, you know, I was necessarily given this path. I don't know. But I think that with enough effort and enough putting yourself out there, I'm always trying to to grow myself personally and then trying to help facilitate the growth of the people around me. So what can I do to help you? And, and if it's bringing my, you know, younger engineers out with me to a lot of these networking events and showing them that it's not terrifying, right? Of course, engineers don't like networking events, as as we know, right. because it's hard to kind of just talk, get up there and talk to, you know, strangers and things like that. And I think facilitating those interactions and helping people realize that it's not as scary as you think. And I think as soon as you, as soon as I started to realize that everyone in the room was nervous, it wasn't just me that was the nervous one. I think I started to feel better about my ability to do that because you're, you're nervous about talking to me for the first time. And so am I. So that's okay. Let's just acknowledge that and move on. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think, and I think what you said is true in that, you know, there are probably a lot of people that can do what you did, like, you know, start a business, grow a business. But I think where people get stuck up is taking the first step, right? Because, you know, leaving a stable job, taking a risk at something that appears to be much more unstable. I think that is where when they see someone else that did it, it gives them some confidence and that maybe I can make the leap too. And then once they get going, they can kind of, you know, build themselves up. So I, I always think that that's valuable. I know I always look for people that did it so yeah, I can get, some, get a feel for that, you know? So that, that's a very positive but thing. I think it's interesting with women, right? I think that we have historically felt this need to compete with each other. And, you know, I have to be better than the other female engineer in the room. And I, I don't feel that way anymore. You know, I feel there's space at the table for all of us. And I think that my goal is to get seats at the table for the women and the minorities that I'm associated with, because that's what's really important. I think as we increase the diversity of our groups and our conversations, that's really where the the magic happens in terms of innovation and coming up with new ideas. And I think that's really important, especially in my community work, because 
I strive to listen to the community and the stakeholders because I work in a lot of different jurisdictions, a lot of different types of communities, urban communities, more rural communities. And what I think they need might not be what they need. So it's more important, I think, to listen than it is to be heard. I think everybody wants to be heard. And I think that knowing what a community needs by listening to them tell me what they need and then using our expertise to facilitate that and maybe push them one step further in in how we can accomplish those goals really goes to you know the heart of what we're saying in all of this is how to run it in terms of running a business or contributing to your community yeah that's awesome no, i love that that's great and uh and, and you're right i think you have to get out there and be a proponent for other women, right? Show them you could do it. Like I like what you said. It's not so much about the competitive approach. It's about everyone helping each other out and lifting each other up. And that's what's going to, I think, create a positive change in the industry as a whole because there's still a lot of work to be done around women in engineering. Absolutely. That's a that's for sure. <laughs> so, Dana, you started the company in 2017. And then, of course, we all know in 2020, you know, COVID happened and, you know, kind of overnight, the whole civil engineering industry, the whole world went remote. Talk about how kind of that cultural change of the shift towards remote work, like how did your company adjust? And then like, how's it gone, you know, since then to still be able to do such a community focused, you know, projects that you talked about with this kind of remote shift? Well, I think it's interesting. Um, Yes, COVID was a lot. I had just hired two young engineers who needed a lot of assistance and training right before the shutdown happened. So we were kind of an interesting position. We shut down and we were actually only closed down for two months because we only had the one office at that time. So we were running, you know, out of our houses. We were, I spent most of my time on the phone or email with my employees trying to keep them moving. But then when Montgomery County lifted their stay-at-home order, we actually opened the office back up to anyone who wanted to come. We didn't, you know, we gave them all the option, but everybody had secluded spaces. So it kind of worked out and we kind of became our own bubble and everyone did come back. So it worked out for me because, you know, I was trying to deal with my kids and work and that was a disaster. But we had our own space. And that was really where I started to implement some of our cultural things that we do in terms of socials and getting together even during office hours. So we would start because nobody had any social engagement, Mm, right? right. They would come to the office, but then, you know, they go back to their apartment or they go back to their houses and everybody was kind of going nuts. So I felt like, well, we're already here and we're already decided we're all comfortable together. So we started doing socials like every couple of weeks around three o'clock. We shut the office down. We'd get some oh, snacks and drinks and stuff and we'd play cornhole or we would played new tailgating games that they all introduced me to that I hadn't played in a while. So we started facilitating some of those things. And it's funny because now we still do them. And if I don't get one on the calendar regularly, they're on me about it. But uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> that we were able to facilitate some of that you know, cultural community through that. In terms of the hybrid work situation, we we have kind of a flexible schedule, but for the most part, I think engineers do do better in the office and in a collaborative environment, yeah. um, especially young engineers. There's no shortage of things we all need to learn. And you really, I think, learn through the collaboration more than you do on a screen. Sometimes it's really hard to show things virtually. So we do have a flexible work schedule in terms of everyone can work from home when they need to. But for the most part, everybody chooses to be in the office. So I think that it kind of works in terms of what I was saying. You know, if your sick kid's sick, you know, I think it's a lot easier to take off when your kid's sick than it used to be because everybody can still get some stuff done. Right. Um, but for the most part. I think it's changed for the most part for the better. I think I'd spend a lot more time on Zoom calls than I used to because now instead of a phone call, everything is a virtual meeting. But, you know, we adapt. You adapt, yeah. Yeah, and I I agree with you in that we're largely remote, but we do bring people to headquarters regularly for meetings. And when we're sitting around the conference room with a whiteboard, I just feel like there's a lot of ideas that come to the table that I don't know if we would get 
if we're all sitting in our homes on the computer, on the Zoom. So, you know, I mean, listen, you can obviously work remote. We've done it for years, but I do think there's a lot of value in making those connections in person. And I would always recommend that any business to try to promote and facilitate that, even if it's not full-time in person, there's avenues for people. And like you said, the tailgating games, getting people together, having fun, building relationships. I think every company kind of needs that to grow. Well, and I think that sometimes the younger generation that may think that remote work is a great idea, they lose that office collaboration and they lose that social engagement that comes with a community of your office staff, right? So I think there's a danger in isolating yourself too much. I personally am kind of an office for, I do better when I'm at my office versus at my house. I can work in my house, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, there's the laundry over there. And I should, you know, when I'm at work, I can focus. And I think, but it also gives me an opportunity to touch base and connect with everybody. And, you know, I got isolated at home for during those couple months and I, I kind of get a little stir crazy. So I think that there is a danger danger in isolating yourself too much from just the 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 mental health that that comes from that connection with people. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. So based on your experience now, you know, building this company and being really involved in our industry in the civil engineering industry, what would you say is like one of the key traits or skills that you think is really important for civil engineering professionals to cultivate in today's climate, especially for those that are kind of tr- trying to make positive impacts on their communities? Um, I think communication is key. I think we've lost a lot of meaningful communication. I think we've lost the ability to listen. I think that people don't hear what other people are saying. I think we're so distracted, right? We're on our phones or we're hearing something else or there's an email or my watch is buzzing. Like we're so connected to all the noise that we don't hear the person in front of us. And have those meaningful conversations that that tell somebody I hear you and I get you and I see that you want a basketball court not a tennis court or or whatever it is like okay I think you need more tennis but you know at the same time you're thinking what do I know so it's just a, a silly example but um, I think that listening and then just leading from a place of love and compassion, I think where you have an understanding that we're all human, we're all into this together. And for the most part, we're all kind of making it up as we go along. Yeah. And you know, to think that anyone really has the answers for work, leadership, you know, kids, any of it, we're, I think we're all just kind of doing our best. And I think as soon as you realize that the guy next to you is doing his best and that we all get to a better place because we're not fighting as much, right? I think in construction and engineering, there's a lot of finger pointing nowadays, right? It's the contractor's fault. It's the architect's fault. It's, you know, I think sure. there, there needs to be a place where we kind of get back to working together and really focusing on the end product for the owner, for the community, and not just, you know, who made the mistake or who did it wrong or like, how can we fix it if there is a mistake? You know, there's a lot of unknowns in this industry, you know, especially I do site design. So we don't know what's under the ground. We can do to the best extent that we can, but, you know, things come up. And I think that leading from a place of working together rather than, you know, fighting is is the most important thing we can kind of change in a very divisive place we've all gotten to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's great. I mean, and I agree with you that I think you could still communicate, of course, in remote situations, but we've sure. lost, it's different, right? And sometimes you can't be as intentional or not as deeply connected to someone when you're going from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom, as opposed to going to someone's office, sitting down with them and having that kind of eye-to-eye conversation. So that's something definitely be aware of. So last question, Dana, just as we kind of wrap up here, for those engineers that are thinking about really going into the leadership side of our industry and becoming leaders and whether it's growing their own business or leading a department for a company or division, just what last piece of advice can you give from your kind of leadership journey over the past years yourself that you can leave them with as something that they should think about as they try to develop their leadership skills and make an impact? I think love what you do. You know, if you can 
grow and lead from a place of passion for where you're going and what you want to accomplish in terms of building a greater community, building a company you can be proud of that not only, you know, makes money because we all have to make money to stay alive, but, you know, to be a place where your employees want to go and to, you know, I've had jobs I didn't want to get up and go to in the morning. And Sunday was so stressful because I didn't want to get up on Monday morning and realize that you're contributing to your community just by being a place your employees want to go every day. And if you can make an impact in those lives, be it two, twelve, twelve thousand, 12,000, then, you know, you're actually accomplishing something in that. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Dana Clark, licensed professional engineer, president of Clark Azar and Associates, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us here today on the Civil Engineering CEO. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dana. What she's doing is inspiring and it's not as easy as she makes it sound. She took a risk and it has paid off for her. And I hope that you took some value out of our conversation. If you enjoyed our conversation, please subscribe here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.